Panzer Dragoon. As far as I'm concerned, this game is reason enough to own a Sega Saturn. That's impressive seeing as how it was a launch game in North America. The game is exhilarating from moment one, kicking things off with an epic cutscene followed by six levels, or episodes in this case, of white knuckle intensity. Developed by Sega's very own Team Andromeda, on incomplete hardware no less, Panzer Dragoon is a 3D rail shooter. Some critics have dismissed it as a Space Harrier clone, but it bears a stronger resemblance to Star Fox on Super Nintendo. The 3D presentation, overall pacing, it's very similar though Panzer Dragoon is way better. I know it's not a fair comparison, so let us forego the hate mail and lengthy comments explaining why Star Fox is the best rail shooter ever made. Anyway, one thing that sets Panzer Dragoon apart from other games in the genre is the story. It defies the arcade-like thrills ahead, setting up a war-torn future where an empire drunk with power discovers an ancient tower housing countless biological weapons used thousands of years prior. Meanwhile, two dragons are locked in aerial combat, witnessed by the lone survivor of a hunting party from below. The blue dragon's rider is mortally wounded and lands beside our lowly hunter. A psychic connection is made and the rider passes on his knowledge, telling the hunter not to let the black dragon reach the tower. Said hunter arms himself, saddles up, and our journey finally begins. Admittedly, the narrative is far from original. We're all familiar with evil empires, devastating weapons capable of destroying mankind, and unlikely heroes facing impossible odds. Regardless, it's told very well, loaded with iconic imagery and outstanding art direction. Like many Saturn games, the cutscenes don't really fill the screen. This is a common complaint among fans as well as detractors. Personally, I couldn't care less. It would have been nice had they been full screen, certainly, but they look great in spite of this. As much as people whine about the FMV, you'd think they were watching a VCD or VHS tape. Like I said, it's a rail shooter. There are six episodes, or seven if one counts the last, where you face the dreaded Black Dragon. Uh, uh, oh, hell no. Before we even tackle that monstrosity, there's a vast array of secondary creatures and fighters you gotta mess with. Everything from ghastly mutations to the wicked Imperial Battle Fleet. You'll engage them over barren wastelands, teeming with giant sandworms and tornadoes. A vast ocean littered with ancient ruins, perilous caverns guarded by the Empire, and so on. No two episodes look alike, and many of the enemies are unique to their respective stages, giving us plenty of variety from one episode to the next. Now at the end of every stage, we're greeted by a boss. Some are small and agile, others are gigantic and deal some serious damage. Enemies attack from all sides, leading us to Panzer Dragoon's one key innovation. Tapping either shoulder button will make the rider face the corresponding direction as the dragon continues onward, making for some dynamic and fresh action sequences. You need to keep an eye on that radar, let me tell you. Unless you've played this numerous times, there's no way in hell you're going to slip into autopilot. Even though I've played this countless times, I always get caught up in the action at some point, forgetting I need to watch my rear at every turn. Your only weapons are the blaster and the dragon's laser attack, which can lock onto as many as eight adversaries, or blast points depending on the size. This is accomplished by holding down the fire button. Once you've locked your targets, release that button and unleash holy havoc. So much awesome. The visuals were stunning for the time. Panzer Dragoon uses texture map polygon renderings as well as sprite scaling and rotation effects to achieve its visuals, giving us a good taste of what the Saturn was capable of. Really, this should have been the pack-in game. Not to say Virtua Fighter was bad, but the Saturn port was riddled with glitches due to its rushed development, and Virtua Fighter 2 had come out a few months prior to the North American Saturn launch. Virtua Fighter didn't look all that fresh then. Sega was all about bringing the arcade experience home, so it made sense that they'd want an arcade port as their pack-in. That being said, Panzer Dragoon has plenty of thrills comparable to some of the best quarter munchers of the day, all while demonstrating the system's superior graphics. Not to mention the sound. This soundtrack is bitchin'. 
The title track has the sweeping majesty of a classic adventure film, though many pieces rock synthesized theatrics reminiscent of Tangerine Dream scores from the 80s. My absolute favorite is episode 3. Then we have the sound effects. Every laser blast, explosion, and defiant cry of your dragon is crisp. Nothing sounds as if it's been recycled from other games, giving Panzer Dragoon a distinctive voice. Really, if you're going to play Panzer Dragoon, play it loud. Eh, screw you, Mario. The first two episodes may seem like a cakewalk at first, but that will change with episode three. The action intensifies considerably, bombarding you with enemies and projectiles. It may not be bullet hell, no, that won't come until episode four. Yeah, it may as well be a ride. For the longest time, I could never pass this stage. Even on the easy setting, I rarely made it to the Guardian. Once I managed to beat this big beast, all I got was a screen telling me to play it at a higher difficulty. Do forgive the lack of video reference. I haven't played this on easy in God knows how long. Just trust me, it happens. Which brings us to the difficulty. It's been said many times that Panzer Dragoon is way too hard. Clearly, these critics never played Duke Nukem 3D on Sega Genesis. Yes, I dug it, but it's one of the hardest games I've ever beaten. Panzer Dragoon is definitely challenging, though far from impossible. The learning curve is fair and balanced, upping the ante gradually as you progress. It's not like we went from this to this. If that were the case, I'd be inclined to agree. Instead, the game eases you into it at a steady pace, unlike Afterburner 2 where it's pure mayhem from stage 2 onward. Yeah, this dragon ain't got nothing on that Tomcat. One other thing that makes it seem so demanding is the lack of lives. All you get are continues, so it's back to the beginning of whatever stage you're on whenever you die. Kind of sucks, but that's the point. It pushes you forward and makes you a stronger player because of it. Besides, depending on how many enemies you perish, you earn more continues. How is that for incentive to play better? If that isn't enough, the only way you'll see the true ending is if you win on the hardest setting. Trust me, after you've played the sequels, you'll be back and more determined than ever. In my opinion, Panzer Dragoon is pure fucking excellence. It's fun, highly addictive, and very rewarding. This game is essential to any Saturn newcomer's library, as are its sequels. Released a year after the original, Panzer Dragoon Zwei is an incredible follow-up. Team Andromeda took an already awesome game and refined it, making it just as good, if not better than, the first. The story is set 20 years before the events depicted in Panzer Dragoon. While nations fight amongst themselves using genetically engineered creatures from centuries before, our attention is focused on a young man as he watches his fellow villagers euthanize a mutant quarry. One year later, Lundy has taken Laggy out for a ride when a large battleship arrives and obliterates the village before his very eyes, thus setting our roaring rampage of revenge into motion. I feel the narrative resonates more than the original. The plot may be basic, though its characters give the ensuing action sequences an emotional weight the first game lacked somewhat. In Panzer Dragoon, our hero kind of stumbles into the action and is saved by a mysterious warrior that's slain moments later. Otherwise, we know very little about either of them. 
With Panzer Dragoon's Vi, Lundy defies the code of his people so as to protect a beloved pet, a creature that will one day grow into a majestic beast of legend carrying you into battle against an ancient enemy. I mean, tell me that's not a great story. The cutscenes are both captivating and evocative. Watching those townspeople execute the quarry never fails to pull at my aging heartstrings. When Lundy looks on laggy moments later, I always feel that same fear of discovery and wonder as if it were the first time. I mean, just look at him. You're rooting for him before the game even starts. That's damn fine storytelling. As for the core gameplay, not much has changed. There are seven episodes in all where you blast one-man fighters, airships, mutations, biological weapons, and turrets culminating in a boss battle. Like the original, it's fast-paced and oh so satisfying. Aside from the usual refinements one would expect, like more on-screen enemies and advanced AI, we now have branching pathways and the Berserk Attack. And thanks to Kevin Smith, I always want to call it Berserker. My love for you is like a truck berserker. Would you like some making fuck berserker? That's fucking funny, man. Did he say making fuck? <laughs> Holy shit, Laggy does not fuck around. Berserk isn't all that different from Laggy's lock-on attack. Whenever you press X, Y, or Z, Laggy will automatically lock onto anything within range and let loose. This is just awesome. It's like 10 seconds of pure rage. The Berserk attack has its own energy bar that will drain as you fire, though it will replenish itself as you take down more enemies. With the branching pathways, only three of the seven episodes have alternate routes. Some are more challenging than others, which plays a part in how you're graded after every level. In Panzer Dragoon, your shot down ratio earned continues. Not here. Now you earn dragon forms. Yeah, the points you earn aid in Laggy's evolution, making him more resilient and increasing the number of locks he can generate. This is where a lot of the replay value is bred from, which brings me to the difficulty. Many critics and players took umbrage with Panzer Dragoon's grueling challenge, so Team Andromeda remedied that with an autosave feature as well as unlimited continues. That seems fair, right? Well, people were bitching that Zwei was, wait, what's that? Way too easy. Jesus Harold Christ on rubber crutches, people. Will you make up your damn mind? You can beat this in one sitting, it's true. But there's an easy solution to this problem. Play it on a harder fucking setting. When I was a kid, I always played Streets of Rage on easy. It wasn't until I got older when I said, damn, I love this game, but it's too easy now. Whatever shall I do? Oh, I know, I'll play it on normal. That's the ticket. Granted, harder settings aren't available at the start. Only after you've beaten the game and opened Pandora's box will you find a treasure trove of bonus features, including a batch of difficulty settings. Zwei is still challenging. The likelihood of anyone beating this without dying once on their first try is low. The first time I played this, I died quite a bit. Episode 3 is when I felt the heat. You have gliders and mutants flanking laggy almost immediately showering you with flaming cannonballs and whatever that shit's supposed to be. Episode 4, like Panzer Dragoon, is like a magic motion simulator through some archaic sewage system. The Rando Dula is especially crafty since it releases these pink blobs. They seem harmless, though they turn into homing energy bolts when fired upon. You can avoid them, but it's a pain in the ass. This is when you start finding enemies that utilize countermeasures to deflect and or dissuade you from using Laggy's lock-on and berserk. I... I... I don't know. I mean, I guess having unlimited continues and autosave do make for an easier game. Unlike Panzer Dragoon 1, it didn't take me anywhere near as long to beat. With that being said, Zwei will put your skills as well as your patience to the test. If someone told me they had beaten it on the hardest setting without dying, the first words out of my mouth would be, video or it didn't happen. No lie, it would blow my mind. Then again, I've been told I'm easily impressed, so what do I know? 
This brings me to the graphics. One thing you'll notice right off the bat is the frame rate. Many felt the original looked too choppy running at 20 frames per second, but it didn't bother me at all. In Zvi, the frame rate is higher with very little lag, which is impressive when you take all the enemies and lush environments into consideration. Again, some of the bosses are just gigantic. The Shell Koof is an entire goddamn stage, yet it's a boss. The fucking thing is huge. The stages are even more vibrant and engaging than those in Panzer Dragoon. In the first episode, you're charging through what remains of Lundy's village. It's chaos, large structures surrounded by enemy craft and monsters littered with fiery debris. You feel like you're at the center of an invasion. I love it. My favorite stage is, without a doubt, episode five. The sunrise, persistent snowfall, and frost-laden ocean surface, it's just gorgeous. These elements have been executed very well, reinforcing that sense of immersion while showing off a broader color palette and sharp textures. Bra fucking vo. Let's talk about the music. In a word, brilliant. Yeah, the orchestral grandeur of the first game is now more tribal and understated. It's like we went from Tangerine Dream to Hans Zimmer. Wait a minute. Strike that. Reverse it. And that's not a slight. Neither score is better than the other. No, in my opinion, both soundtracks are first rate and complement their respective games. Panzer Dragoon Zwei is, I dare say, a perfect sequel, or do I mean prequel, whatever. If you loved the original, I think it's safe to say that you'll fucking adore Zwei. The polished visuals, engrossing narrative, stirring soundtrack, kick-ass gameplay, flawless control, and bonus content make it the best of the bunch. Maybe. Before I even tackle the juggernaut that is Panzer Dragoon Saga, I gotta get something off my chest. I'm not a big fan of role-playing games. I know, how can I be a hardcore gamer and not love a good RPG? 
Well, I feel my biggest issue is the combat system. The very notion of just standing there waiting for my turn while leaving me open to an attack that is sure to come just seems absurd. I always felt action should be kinetic, not static. That's just me though, I could be wrong. Needless to say, I was both confused and disappointed to find out that Panzer Dragoon Saga, the third chapter in a series of rail shooters, was a fucking RPG. With only 30,000 copies produced in North America, it's rare, thus making it one of the more expensive Saturn titles available. I'm sure the simple fact that many gamers see it as one of the best role-playing games ever made for any console has nothing to do with padding its rather considerable asking price. In spite of these obstacles, the one thing that really excited me was the thought of expanding on Dragoon's mythology. Oddly enough, Saga went into development around the same time as Zvi. Bringing this epic to life was an arduous task to say the least. Over the course of two years, the team of 40 had to struggle with converting their action series into an RPG and somehow satisfy newcomers without alienating fans of the original. And by some miracle, they succeeded. I say that because I fucking love this game. The story is set sometime after the events depicted in Panzer Dragoon. Our protagonist is a young Imperial soldier, Edge, guarding an excavation site amidst a dusty wasteland. Edge is somewhat unhappy with his assigned duty, craving action over peace and quiet. Suddenly, the mine is harassed by a large mutant creature. Edge quells the situation while discovering an ethereal-looking woman buried within the rock. Before he can satisfy his curiosity, the site is attacked by the mutinous Kraymen and his followers. They make off with the mysterious woman and shoot Edge, knocking him into an underground reservoir. That is when he finds the dragon, or the dragon finds him. Like the previous games, this dragon communicates with the rider telepathically and aids in his escape. The dragon takes Edge back to the site and that's where he finds his dying captain. Fueled by rage, Edge then vows revenge and sets out on his mission with you by his side. I named mine you. Dorky? Perhaps. Do I care? Not one damn bit. Though it may sound simplistic for an RPG, it's anything but. As the story unravels, you'll meet up with some fascinating personalities that explain the myths surrounding these majestic creatures as well as the ancients, the beings responsible for the great war mentioned in Panzer Dragoon, and maybe even Azel herself. Yes, the woman from the mine. Edge will follow Kraymen into the barren valleys of the Geralt Desert, the ominous ocean of the Forbidden Zone, even one of the infamous towers. The story may not be all that original, I mean any sci-fi fantasy fan worth their weight in salt has dealt with the hero's journey, artificial life, and evil empires hell bent on world domination. Regardless, it's told really, really well. Pacing is spot on and dialogue is both subtle and sophisticated. <laughs> Speaking of dialogue, that was something I neglected to mention in my previous video. Yukio Futatsugi, the director of both Panzer Dragoon and Saga, worked with his team to create a fictional language as opposed to falling back on either English or Japanese. Apparently it's a mixture of ancient Greek, Latin, and Russian. Talk about going above and beyond the Call of Duty. Unlike the first two games, Panzerese is only heard in the beginning and the very end. Every other spoken word is Japanese. Regardless, the actors did a fantastic job conveying the emotion necessary for any given sequence and should be applauded for their efforts. Unlike so many role-playing games made pre- or post-Saga, you aren't following a band of do-gooders on some Tolkien-like quest to battle the forces of evil. It's a young man looking to avenge his fallen comrades while rescuing a woman lost in time, with his only ally being an armored dragon. Sure, he meets up with some interesting personalities along the way, but they're supporting characters at most. They don't join you in combat, nor do you have to take care of them when the metaphorical fit hits the Shan. There's no one to turn to if you die. The only being you can really count on is you. I don't mean you, you. I mean the dragon. 
This may be a desolate land, haunted by sins now centuries old. You may be taking on a corrupt superpower by yourself, but none of that matters because your greatest weapon and most loyal confederate just so happens to be your ride. Azel is a fascinating character. When she appeared, the first thought that came to mind was, oh, there's the damsel in distress. The next time you see Azel, she's fighting by Kramen's side. Why is that? Well, I'm not saying. Like I said, the story is what drove this franchise into RPG territory in the first place, and I don't want to give everything away in a fucking YouTube video. A great deal of the story is shown through these exquisite cutscenes. Character models have more detail and the animation is smoother and more lifelike. The compositions, lighting, and editing are first rate. Even the in-game sequences stand out. If someone were to cut these scenes together, I think you would have an awesome movie. And I haven't even talked about the gameplay yet. You'll spend a lot of time exploring these expansive, fully rendered 3D environments by air, uncovering various items locked away in these rotating obelisks that your dragon can blast open in real time. These items range from healing elixirs, weapon upgrades, kittens, whoops, huh, wrong game. The underground ruins of Yuru may throw you when you're forced to abandon the dragon and ride a floater, limiting your attacks to Edge's modest abilities during battle. On foot, Edge can wander about a few locations, such as the caravan and the village of Zoa, just to name a couple, where you visit various establishments and engage in some enlightening conversations with their respective inhabitants. Just like any other RPG, there are shops where you can buy and or sell items, locals feed you information pertinent to your task, or make it their mission to make Edge feel unwelcome, at least at first. It's standard stuff, though it's well executed. Some graphical limitations can be seen here, namely clipping and pixelated textures when viewed up close. This didn't take anything away from the game for me personally. Oftentimes I was distracted by the light sourcing and what could it be? Transparencies? Well, I'll be damned. It's interesting to note that the developers chose to use transparencies for clouds and mist while using the all too familiar waffle fry pattern for rays of light. Surprisingly, it comes together nicely. Okay, enough fapping. Another place where Edge can stretch his legs are the campgrounds. Can't go very far, but you can save the game here, advance time, or pet your dragon. That or ignore him, but why would you want to be an asshole? The one thing you really can't do well on foot is start a fight, which brings me to the battle system. As you can see, it's turn-based combat. You have three action gauges. Once one is full, you can strike with Edge's blaster, the dragon's lock-on attack, hitting several enemies at once or as many blast points possible on a single adversary, or you can use an item. If two or even all three action gauges are maxed out, you can use a berserk. Think of berserk as magic. Depending on your skill level, Edge will have a wide array of attacks and healing abilities, some of which are absolutely dazzling to watch. Two features that rock my controller is the ability to maneuver in real time. If you look to the radar, you'll see that there are safe zones indicated by the green cone shape and danger zones. I know what you may be thinking, but you can't just sit back and lay waste to your opponents in perfect safety. Enemies can maneuver as well, pushing you toward a hot spot. Some have weak points that are only accessible within a danger zone. Moving around too much can prolong the battle, wasting vital resources, and your action gauges won't replenish while maneuvering. With that being said, this is a great feature that keeps the action moving while adding another level of strategy. The second feature is the dragon's morphing ability. There are five basic types, balanced, attack, spirit, 
defense, and agility, each of which have their own unique advantages, like the spirit form that replenishes your berserk power. That and your dragon looks badass in every configuration. After every battle, you're given a grade that will affect your experience points in dying. The better you rank, the faster your dragon will level up. There's so much more to this game, it's ridiculous. Saga didn't receive an official strategy guide, so gamers still find hidden gems to this day. Like any great work of art, you find something new every time you look at it. This game is massive in almost every sense of the word. Everything from the narrative, play mechanics, and presentation are top shelf. As far as I'm concerned, Panzer Dragoon Saga is more than deserving of its status as one of the best role-playing games ever made. One thing to keep in mind, the original source code has been confirmed lost by its director, so it won't be showing up on XBLA or PSN anytime soon. Panzer Dragoon Saga is a true Saturn exclusive. Always has been and probably always will be.